Day 643 of the Trump administration, 13 days out now from the midterm elections. And the president has held, as of tonight, his latest rally in Wisconsin as the hunt is on for whoever sent explosive devices to his political opponents. The targets are all public figures, including President Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, her husband, the former president, and all are frequently attacked by Donald Trump at his rallies and on social media. Tonight, the president opened his event with this. I want to begin tonight's rally by addressing the suspicious devices and packages that were mailed to current and former high-ranking government officials. My highest duty, as you know, as president, is to keep America safe. That's what we talk about. That's what we do. The federal government is conducting an aggressive investigation, and we will find those responsible, and we will bring them to justice, hopefully very quickly. Any acts or threats of political violence are an attack on our democracy itself. The closest the president came to using the names of the former presidents tonight was to call them current and former high-ranking government officials. Now to this map. The first crude bomb was delivered Monday to the suburban New York home of the billionaire philanthropist George Soros, of course a major donor to mostly Democratic causes. Tuesday, Secret Service intercepted a pipe bomb addressed to Hillary Clinton at her home in Chappaqua, New York, just nine miles west of Soros. Wednesday morning, Secret Service picked up another package headed to President Obama's home in Washington. Also today, a bomb intended for former Attorney General Eric Holder was incorrectly addressed, and it landed at the office of Florida Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. While she had nothing to do with it, the return address on the envelope was her office. Another package addressed to former CIA Director John Brennan, a big Trump critic who the president has called a lowlife, was delivered to CNN's headquarters here in New York, even though Brennan is affiliated not with CNN, but with NBC. CNN was actually covering a story about these suspicious packages when the alarm sounded in their studio and their building was evacuated. These are no longer suspicious packages. The, right. the FBI is saying that they were rudimentary but functional. functional. That means they were explosive devices. And to have projectiles, I mean, that's a... Excuse me, that sounds like a fire alarm here. We'll keep you posted on that. Okay, um, we're going to jump in. There's, There's a, fire a fire alarm, alarm here. here. You might have heard it in the background. We're going to find out what the latest is uh, we'll here right at CNN. We're going to be right back. Luckily, the best police department in the world quickly responded. The NYPD bomb squad was quickly on the scene. Here is how the New York City Police Commissioner described what was inside the package sent to CNN. Responding officers identified a device that appeared to be a live explosive device. Additionally, there was an envelope containing white powder that was discovered as part of that original packaging. NBC News reports tonight that an image of that bomb sent to CNN appeared to have a parody of an ISIS flag taken from a meme circulating among some right-wing Internet sites. According to the FBI, the packages sent to Obama, the Clinton, Soros, Holder, and CNN were in manila envelopes with bubble wrap inside. They had computer-printed addresses, six so-called forever stamps, along with a ton of tape on the outside, it appears. And all packages had a return address of, again, Debbie Wasserman Schultz in Florida with misspellings. Senior law enforcement officials also tell NBC News tonight the bombs in those packages were made, they believe, of PVC pipe, contained a timer, had powder used in pyrotechnics traditionally, and likely contained shrapnel. Also tonight, the FBI confirms that two additional packages addressed to another Trump target and Trump critic, Democratic Congresswoman Maxine Waters of California, are similar in appearance to the other packages. We have journalists from the Washington Post and Associated Press standing by to join us with their reporting. But first, we want to get updated on the investigation. And for that, I want to bring in Bill Bratton, former commissioner of the NYPD and Boston Police, former chief of police in Los Angeles, and Frank Figluzzi, former FBI assistant director for counterintelligence, who worked on the anthrax investigation back in 2001. Commissioner, as you well know, because we've been through anthrax, our building here 
here is very well equipped for this kind of thing with machinery and detection. Uh, uh, I need your assessment of what you witnessed today and what are you looking for? Well, I think certainly the response was exceptional here in New York City, That uh, seeing that firsthand uh, on the part of the federal government agencies, FBI, et cetera, very quickly uh, identifying these devices. They're now all down at the FBI lab, if I understand it correctly. We had a live device at Columbus Circle in New York City. That's correct. And what was described as a live device as to what it will eventually turn out to be remains to be seen, whether they were capable of uh, exploding, uh, whether through error of design or never having that capability in the first place. But uh, the net effect was fear, a tremendous amount of fear, uh, fear that's still being felt. Uh, in my world, the security world, significant number of clients calling in uh, asking for uh, information. And uh, that's an area where the NYPD is a great, does a great job. They have 19,000 subscribers to their SHIELD program set up by my predecessor, Commissioner Kelly, after the 9-11 events to alert and keep informed with as much intimacy as possible uh, information about threats. And today was a clear example of the benefit of that. 19,000 security directors getting information, including pictures, description of the devices, what to watch for, and procedures to follow. Uh, Frank Figluzzi, so much to go on here already, given just the little bit that we know. You see a package wrapped in that much uh, scotch tape, you think, well, uh, that's good because tape is kind of a DNA magnet. Think of all the things from your person, your environment can stick to it and then be tested. Um, but what were you looking for in terms of construction? Is this a, to your view, based on what we know, sophisticated bomb maker? Brian, the reports we're getting so far indicate a primitive type device. In fact, as Commissioner Bratton referenced, we still don't know for certain whether or not these devices were capable of detonating. In fact, if they were, and if the report is accurate about the CNN device being live, then, then the question I have in my mind is, why didn't they detonate? Was this a deliberate attempt to send a message, invoke fear, tell us that something more is coming, or have we seen the end of this? I, I would say we've not seen the end, just based on historical experience with mail bombers and serial bombers. They keep going until they're caught, generally. Um, this is perhaps a first round, and we may see a change in methodology and, and what, what the bombs look like moving forward. But tonight, the FBI and law enforcement is racing the clock because of the possibility that more bombs are out there and perhaps this time they may go off. Can't think of uh, two gentlemen we'd rather have on a night like tonight to start off our coverage. Bill Bratton, Frank Figluzzi, thank you both. Uh, if you take a look at some of President Trump's rallies over just this past week, many of his go-to targets have received these suspicious packages. Crooked Hillary is a great unifier. Maxine Waters. You get that one? You get that? Good old Maxine. Low IQ individual. Low IQ. You ever see when the fake news interviews them and then they try and cut it, but they never, they'll go to a person holding a sign who gets paid by Soros or somebody. Right? That's what happens. By the way, by the way. Don't worry, I don't like him either, okay? For more, we welcome in our political panel, Philip Rucker, a Pulitzer Prize-winning White House bureau chief for The Washington Post, Jill Colvin, White House reporter for the Associated Press, and Robert Costa, national political reporter for The Post and moderator of Washington Week on PBS. Thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome to all of you and fill this correlation between critics of Trump, targets of Trump, and all those who got a potentially deadly surprise in the mail today, as you do your reporting, any recognition from the Trump forces that there may be some responsibility they bear for tone at minimum? 
Yeah, Brian, it's an important question today, and we've been looking for any of that recognition throughout the day. The White House has not uh, recognized or, or at least acknowledged that the president's rhetoric in any way has influenced this. And in fact, the president, in his public remarks this afternoon at the White House and then in the campaign trail at a rally tonight in Wisconsin, stopped short of accepting any sort of personal responsibility for the inflammatory uh, contributions that he has made to the political discourse this fall. But as you just showed in those video clips, the president's rhetorical targets have been very clear at rally after rally after rally, and those very targets became the targets this week uh, of these mailings, of these these uh, these bombs, these explosive devices that were sent. Uh, there's no evidence from investigators connecting uh, the shipments to any sort of political campaign or plot or, or any motivation that is directly related to Trump. Uh, but again, there are a lot of questions being raised in the political political world about the president's rhetoric. The president, for his part, has been saying uh, that the rhetoric as a whole needs to come down a notch. He's been calling for unity. He's even blamed the media for playing a role in, in the rhetoric, but he has not accepted any personal responsibility for, for the way in which the tone of his speeches has contributed. And Robert Costa, as recently as our broadcast last night, we were surmising that fear was just going to be the closing argument as we approach the 26, 2018 uh, midterms, and there's this caravan coming. Uh, there are kind of sketchy Middle Easterners as part of the caravan. They're coming for your home, your property, your family. Does this change that now? Fear. It's not just the title of a Bob Woodward book. It's the story of this year's midterm elections. A dark cloud hangs over the upcoming November contest. You have fact checks about the president's language on the, the immigrant caravan that's coming up, the 5,000 or so migrants from Central America, different statements without evidence from this administration about those immigrants and their experience. Uh, the Kavanaugh confirmation charged up the culture wars and now political violence at the fore of our national debate. It has brought, as much as Democrats are talking and some Republicans talking about health care and other important issues on the campaign trail, it really is the broader culture, fear, violence, facts. That's really what's at the center for both parties. Jill Colvin, it was, uh, I guess, a violation of protocol for a sitting president, not to mention two former targeted presidents. It's such a small club, after all. But let's not forget John Brennan, former CIA director, uh, was on this list as well. I'm going to play for you what he said today. Remember, as a longtime overseas station chief, as they say, he doesn't scare easily. And we'll talk about it on the other side. Unfortunately, I think Donald Trump too often has helped to incite uh, some of these feelings of, of anger, if not violence, um, when he points to acts of violence or also talks about you know, uh, swinging at somebody uh, from the press or the media. Uh, that's why I have spoken out so strongly, some would say very stridently, because of what I think is a continued failure on the part of Donald Trump to live up to what I think should be all of our expectations about what an American president should be doing, especially in times like this. John Brennan, who was, of course, called a lowlife by the president. Jill, the question is, um, can Brennan speaking like this cause other Brennans to speak out? Or if there were any potential profiles and courage, especially on the Republican side, would we know about it by now? I think at this point, everyone pretty much knows what the president's M.O. is. You know, there have been endless opportunities at this point uh, for members of the Republican Party to stand up uh, when the president goes after people like Brennan or Eric Holder or any of the litany, the hundreds of people that the president has gone after now in his, you know, three or four years in the political spotlight. And that's something that we really have not seen happen. I also have to say that, you know, the president's message today was one of calling for unity. Uh, he really— uh, kind of advocated this idea that we should have this new moment of, of civility in politics. And the idea that President Trump is going out there with this message just reeks of hypocrisy. Uh, this is a president who 
won an election, who campaigned uh, using incredibly inflammatory rhetoric. This is a candidate who, uh, at his campaign rallies, used to urge his supporters to beat up protesters who would come to his, his rallies to protest his messages. Uh, he's somebody who has consistently, each and every person on the list that was targeted today, and endless others, has used inflammatory rhetoric against them. Um, so it's, it's interesting to have the president uh, now saying that this is the moment for civility. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.